Uh, well, good afternoon, uh, everyone, and welcome to uh, this plenary session, uh, which is entitled Using Procurement to Build Back Better. Uh, we've attached a question mark to that, which we might give some thought to later. Um, my name is Anne Davis. I'm a senior research fellow at the GoLab, and uh, we have got a great panel addressing this question from a variety of different uh, institutions and jurisdictions. We've got a mix of uh, practitioners and scholars, and uh, hopefully there are some interesting lessons to be learned. Um, I did a bit of Googling of the, the slogan, the Building Back Better slogan, um, and it's pretty popular at the moment, both internationally and in particular states. So uh, lots of usages in the UN, the OECD, the World Bank, the G7, um, UK government, President Biden's campaign. Uh, there's even a bit of online discussion between Biden and Boris Johnson as to who was the first to coin the slogan. Um, but in fact, it has some slightly older origins that I detected in a UN program for rebuilding after natural disasters, where it's got a very specific meaning about making sure that um, after you've had floods or earthquakes or something like that, the new uh, structures that you create are going to be better at withstanding um, those floods or earthquakes or whatever. So when we're thinking about building back better using procurement after a pandemic, I think we're thinking about something a little bit less specific. We're not really thinking quite so much about pandemic resilience, but I think we're thinking more about um, uh, improving economic resilience and uh, maybe recovering from some of the harmful effects of the pandemic itself. Um, it looks like it's more of a sort of political moment for change, really. Um, and I hope that uh, one of the things that our panelists might explore is whether this is a good moment for change, um, particularly given some of the financial pressures on governments and some of the issues around trust in the procurement process, which we've uh, particularly seen arising in the UK after some of the emergency procurement issues that we've seen uh, during the pandemic. Um, I think there are some other great questions that we could explore here. Um, who, what counts as better uh, in building back better and who's deciding that question? Is it governments, is it citizens, is it contractors? Um, and I think there are all kinds of interesting angles to explore there. And of course, the big question, what are the pros and cons of using procurement in this way? And how do we make building back better something that is more than just a slogan, something that is actually making a real difference on the ground to uh, different people uh, in, in the real world, as it were. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to move on to our panel discussion. And uh, we've got uh, to begin with uh, Chris McCrudden, who's a professor of law at Queen's University Belfast, who's written extensively in this area including a book called Buying Social Justice, which will be well known to many of you. And Chris is going to uh, frame some of today's discussion for us and set up some, uh, no doubt, challenging questions um, for our other panelists to address. And I'll ask each of the panelists to introduce themselves as, as, they, as, as we go through. Um, so uh, Chris, uh, over to, to you to get us going. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Anne. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfect. Thanks. Um, so it's, it's a, it really is a pleasure to be with you today, if, if only by, via Zoom. I'm really sorry not to be with you in person. Um, so my apologies. So um, public procurement issues, I think particularly this linkage between procurement and um, delivering social value has long been an interest of mine, stretching back even um, to the 1970s, hard to believe, when um, I first encountered the issue as a, as a callow graduate student at, at Yale Law School. And as Anne was kind enough to say, that interest uh, eventually resulted in uh, the book, that Buying Social Justice, um, published in, I think it was 2007, a long time ago. But as a, as a result of this interest, um, I've attended many, uh, many conferences and discussions on whether to and how to build social value into the procurement function. And at, at the risk of sounding um, a little jaded, um, these discussions tend, in my experience at least, to rehash um, 
familiar themes um, and um, too frequently at least don't really progress much beyond earnest commitments to the importance of including social value. So let's take that as read. Um, recognition that it isn't easy, which it isn't, and firm promises to do better this time around. So these, these, these have tended, these kinds of encounters have tended in my experience to be a mixture of the film Groundhog Day, in, in which you remember the, the Bill Murray character is shocked when he wakes up and realizes that he's reliving the same day over and over. So it seems to be a combination of Groundhog Day and, you know, the joke about the goldfish in the bowl, uh, you know, the one, the goldfish is swimming around the bowl and every time it passes the curtains, says in a surprise, that's a nice pair of curtains. And then a few moments later, having swum around the bowl again, that's a nice pair of curtains and so on endlessly. So my hope is that after our discussions today, um, I won't feel like Bill Murray um, and that our participants will not behave like the goldfish in the bowl, um, endlessly repeating uh, the same mantras, uh, reinventing the wheel as it were. So how, how can we move forward? Um, well, I think we need to address directly and with candor some really difficult issues rather than gliding past them. Uh, and here are a few questions that I personally would like uh, some answers to um, from, from the panel. So these are in no particular order. Uh, the, the procurement function often seems to focus on getting social value into procurement and often, in my experience at least, doesn't ensure that whatever the contractor agrees to is actually implemented post-award. So there seems often to be a gap between um, the procurement uh, delivery question and the procurement award question. Um, so if that's the case, how is that going to be addressed this time around? Second kind of question, um, again, in, in, in my experience, procurement officials are not infrequently uneasy about being required to make sometimes rather subjective judgments about whether a tender offer satisfies the social value requirements. Um, not least because they're then in the hot seat if, when is challenged. So how are procurement officials to be incentivized to take these frequently politically controversial decisions rather than avoid them? Thirdly, the role of law in this context as placing limits on what can be done. So we're now switching from a relatively well-known system of EU procurement regulation, whether you liked it or not, to the WTO procurement regime under the new Trade and Cooperation Agreement. What will the impact of this change have on the question of the legal consequences for a procurement body of engaging in social value contracting? I mean, so far as I know, there have been no decisions by the WTO on what um, the limits may or may not be on social value procurement under the WTO. It's simply unknown territory. Um, do we know, for example, uh, in terms of the impact of it legally in, U in the UK, do we know whether the TCA will be available to be used by UK courts, in UK courts by disappointed tenderers? Um, certainly there's been an argument made that section 29 of the European Union Future Relationship uh, Act, the 2020 Act, um, may allow that to happen. And while we're on the legal issues arising, what exactly is the relationship in terms of social value procurement um, between the provisions of the TCA and the withdrawal agreement? Um, in particular, um, Article 7 of the Northern Ireland Protocol, um, because that's going to determine um, whether and to what extent um, procurement on the island of Ireland is, go is going to be governed by one regime rather than another. Uh, and then we come to the, the more normative question. So to what extent is social value contracting unfair in its distributional effects? So will it be easier, for example, for larger tenderers to comply than smaller tenderers? Um, and if the particular social value that's being encouraged is so important, 
Why is it being applied only to companies with government contracts rather than across the board to all companies? How do we deal, maybe um, a little dramatically, but how do we deal with the dark side of social value procurement? Um, it's misuse as an instrument for protectionism, whether intentional or not. The close connection between what purports to be social value procurement on occasion and an increase in corruption in the award of contracts. The, the more discretion there is in the award of the contract, the greater the opportunity for cronyism. Um, and mentioned rather delicately the, uh, the questions of what was happening during the uh, pandemic awards. So I, I understand um, that uh, the government uh, proposes to um, retain the basic requirement that award criteria must be linked to the subject matter of the contract, but amending it to allow specific exceptions set by government. But what are those exceptions? And, and more particularly, what's the underlying principle or principles guiding the choice of these exceptions? Okay, lastly, I've exhausted your patience, I suspect, but lastly, what system will be established for monitoring the balance between costs and benefits going forward? So we need to know in, that in five years time or 10 years time, we're still, that, that we're not still unclear about where the balance of advantage actually lies here. So what system is envisaged as enabling lessons to be learned on an independent basis uh, with as little spin as possible? So I'm looking forward immensely to hearing that my concerns, of course, are irrelevant or exaggerated um, or already being dealt with, and that we can safely and confidently move to the sunny uplands. But um, forgive me if I need to see the detail before being convinced. Um, please, not another Groundhog Day. Uh, fantastic. Thank you, Chris, for that very uh, provocative introduction. Um, panelists, I'm afraid you've still only got five minutes uh, for your contributions, despite that um, uh, quite demanding set of questions. Uh, so I'm going to hand straight over to Abby Semple. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves so that I don't take up too much time with that. So Abby, over to you to uh, tell us who you are and to answer some of those questions. OK, thanks very much, Anne. Um, I take it you can hear me OK there and um, like like Chris I'm sorry not to be with you in Oxford but hopefully next year manage manage to make it back to Oxford and thank you very much uh, for uh, so I'm Abby Semple I'm a consultant working with the public sector primarily on the environmental and social aspects of, of public procurement uh, working at European level as well as as local and national level in, in, in various countries um, and a member a proud member of, of the um, POGO group within the, the government outcomes lab over the last couple of years um, having the opportunity to look at some of these issues in more detail um, with, with some of the people here today as well. Um, so yes, quite quite a, a challenge um, that's been thrown down there. And, and one of the things I've always admired about Professor McCodden's book, uh, work is the, you know, the taking of a long view in that, you know, this whole issue of linkages, social value, social outcomes is not new. You know, it's, it probably goes back almost as far as the idea of, of you know, government spending money or, or power spending money and, um, you know, the desire to, to achieve multiple objectives. Um, and really what was new in you know, the, the 1970s and 1980s, as, as was mentioned, was this idea of uh, you know, economic orthodoxy coming into the whole area of public procurement and it becoming part of this bigger project around competition, open markets, et cetera. Um, but to me, I think I'm perhaps a little bit more sanguine about this moment in time being different, and I'll try and explain why. Um, the bottom line for me is that we're coming out of a period of about 10 years. And um, so since the, 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 the financial crisis, really, um, of, of chipping away at this economic orthodoxy, um, which has held great power over certainly procurement regulation and also procurement practice over, over perhaps 20 or 30 years. Um, and to me, that seemed to emerge, you know, on the back of the financial crisis, there was obviously um, a huge need for, for government to step in. Um, to try and try and fix things, um, uh, you know, to alleviate poverty, amongst many other things, alleviate unemployment. 
Um, however, there was also a huge constraint, obviously, on, on public spending and public finances. Um, so we saw public procurement, you know, the spotlight turning to public procurement uh, around, the, particularly around the time of the reform of the European directives. So around two, between 2011 and, and 2014. And very clearly the mandate for, for public procurement to step up and achieve more in the way of social outcomes. Um, and I think over the past 10 years, that has become a relatively uncontroversial project, certainly within the European Union, and you can say within other jurisdictions, perhaps going back further, that that's been the case. Um, and I'll be interested to hear Anna's comments as well from the European Commission perspective. Um, but so, so what that means to me is that we now have, you know, upwards of a decade of experience and also to some extent a legal framework which really support this idea of, of, of you know, pursuing social outcomes through public procurement. Um, and what that means is that we've also started to chip away, although certainly not completely eliminate um, what, what, what Chris referred to in terms of the implementation gap. So not just sort of putting nice to haves in our, in our tender documents, but also actually seeing what that means in practice. And I think the Go Lab has been really instrumental in bringing a lot of that experience together, as we've seen both within this conference and within, within its ongoing work. So, uh, you know, a lot of experience, a lot of information, a lot of data coming, coming to the fore about what public contracts can really achieve uh, in terms of social outcomes. Um, and I think what's different this time around is that in the wake of the financial crisis, as I mentioned, we have severe constraints on, on, on public finances, and we don't seem to have that at the moment. We seem to be awash in cash, um, or at least most public bodies are not getting the, uh, the message at this point in time that there's a need for serious constraint in, in public spending. So slightly different scenario um, on that, on top of the change, you know, the changes that have taken place in the legal framework, as well as the experience that we have around social outcomes contracting, uh, I think perhaps all, all bode well for, for, for the next few years. Um, now, I, I share Professor McCrudgeon's, um, you know, sort of concern about the vagueness around, in particular, the, um, the government procurement agreement. You know, we're basically missing case law, we're missing interpretation around that. So if we're being told that this is now our underlying legal framework in the United Kingdom, uh, there are a lot of questions to be asked about that. Um, and what really interests me in terms of the UK's uh, current project in terms of law reform is the trade-offs that are inevitably faced when you when, when you come to, to write procurement law. So we want um, transparency, we want a rules-based system for, for obvious reasons, um, which have perhaps become even clearer in the light of the pandemic, but we also want flexibility. Uh, we want competition, uh, but we also want to have this ability to collaborate or to foster longer term relationships with, with suppliers. So um, inevitably there are trade-offs between these objectives. Um, and I think what, what this group perhaps, um, you know, is, is perhaps able to contribute um, over time is, 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 you know, that experience and that data around, well, you know, in individual contracts, where do we find that trade off? How do we measure the outcomes? How do we actually wrap that up in, in, in terms of procedures and, and, and make it work on the ground? Um, so lots to learn still, but to me, uh, a relatively, op um, you know, optimistic view, I think, on where we are at the moment. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Abby. Um, I'm going to hand straight over to uh, our next speaker, uh, Colin Earhart from Harvard. Colin. Thank you. And, and thank you, Abby and Professor Magruden, for those opening comments and, and insights. It's definitely resonating uh, with what I'm seeing in the field. So it's great to be with everyone today. Um, my name is Colin Earhart. I am a project leader at the Harvard Kennedy School Government Performance Lab, working as part of our procurement and economic mobility team that partners with local and state governments across the United States to ensure that procurement and contracting, which often makes up anywhere from 25 to 33 percent of local government spending in the U.S., is used as a strategic tool to actually improve residents' lives. So as part of our work in the U.S., we've been in conversations with dozens of U.S. cities and states to understand the challenges and opportunities they see related to the drastic increase in federal stimulus dollars that are coming after and, and currently during COVID. So I think as folks know, in the US, there's sort of two main funding streams that that's happening. There was originally CARES Act money that was largely about meeting the immediate need of the COVID recovery. And then more recently, there is the American Rescue Plan or ARPA funding that is leading to billions of dollars being given directly to state and local governments to invest 
in transformational system changes and to truly build back better. So the U.S. Treasury, which is overseeing much of this money that's being spent by state and local governments, is interestingly really focused on this question of equity in the United States and ensuring that however these plans are designed and operationalized, that it's directly addressing systemic inequities that have been uh, in the United States for, for decades. So that's sort of the first interesting piece, I would say. And the second piece is that as we're talking to governments, we're seeing both in those conversations and in their publicly released ARPA plans, that they are really heeding this call from the federal government and trying to use this money to make major systemic reforms. But they face very real challenges, and, and Professor Magruden started to allude to some of this, around how to actually operationalize this funding, especially through the procurement of contracted goods and services. So there's really been four main challenges that we've heard, and two of them, I think, overlap with some of the opening comments that were made. So the first challenge that we're hearing is this idea about how to balance using established procurement processes that may be slower and more bureaucratic with leveraging versus leveraging emergency procurement authorities that may be able to get money out sooner and to help residents faster. So how do you find that balance between sort of the flexibility of using those authorities that may make things go faster versus sort of the protections that a more uh, bureaucratic system may provide. The second, which the professor alluded to, is around how to actually manage contract performance and ensure that when, uh, when these contracts are being put into place and different providers and vendors are being brought on to deliver these social services, that there's not just a basic meeting of compliance requirements from the federal government, but that providers and vendors are actually being held accountable for their service delivery and that results are actually coming out of these contracts to move the needle on many of these difficult social problems. The third challenge is really about ensuring that this money is not just going to the same pool of vendors and providers that may be getting these contracts historically. So in the United States, there's a lot of focus on ensuring a more diverse set of vendors and providers are getting awarded contracts, including minority-owned, women-owned, small business enterprises, to really broaden the pool of expertise and resources that are going to a wider range of both private sector vendors, but also community organizations in the nonprofit sector. And then lastly, there's this very real challenge that I'll elaborate a little bit more on some solutions around funding sustainability. So I definitely agree with the opening panelists that this moment is, is very different. I think there's a lot of excitement about sort of government interventions and money that's sort of becoming available in a way that it never has before. But at least in the US, a lot of this money has a, a sunset. Essentially, at least with um, ARPA money, it must be spent by 2026. So there's a lot of concerns within government about cliffs that may happen for new programs and initiatives once they get closer to that deadline and what that will mean for all these investments that are happening now. So I'll close by elaborating a little bit on sort of what we're hearing is a way to sort of balance that last challenge around funding sustainability. And then happy to talk about the others during the Q&A too. So the first thing that we're hearing to sort of direct, to combat this funding and sustainability challenge is that folks are making direct one-time investments in human and physical capital. So they're purposely picking investments for things like upgrading technological systems, increasing data analytic capabilities, upskilling staff, all things that one-time investments can really make a difference even beyond COVID and then ultimately the ongoing maintenance costs could be a lot lower. So that's sort of the first thing that we're hearing. The second is that folks are trying to use this moment and this new funding to make the case for future funding. So they're piloting new initiatives and programs and then trying to demonstrate through rigorous evaluation methodologies to other stakeholders like philanthropic groups or even state and federal leaders about how these programs are really making a difference. And even when these federal funds run out that there's a reason to continue them past that deadline. And then lastly, especially in the social services realm, we're seeing folks use this one-time money to start to build and procure for more preventative social service systems. So in, currently a lot of governments have in place more reactive systems that are intervening at later stages. And the goal is that if they can use this temporary funding to, to sort of be a bridge and to start much earlier, that that could lead to reducing the demand and need on those systems that are happening later in the life cycle. So that's really some of the exciting things we're hearing and, and happy to elaborate more on that during the Q&A. 
Great. Thank you very much indeed, Colin, for uh, that perspective from the US. Uh, we're going to move uh, over to the EU now um, and hear from Anna Lupi. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anne, and thank you for inviting me today. Um, I'm Anna Lupi. I work for the European Commission in the unit um, that is essentially responsible for public procurement policy and in particular in the team dealing with um, strategic and sustainable public procurement. Um, and I've been in charge for a number of years um, of the uh, Commission's policy on uh, socially responsible public procurement and uh, working with ABI very often. Um, I can only echo what Abby and Colin just said uh, regarding how different this moment feels from, uh, from the past few years at least. Um, and precisely because of the, uh, of the public stimulus that is, uh, that, is, uh, that is going to be put on the table. Um, at least, at least in the in the EU, and uh, and it's of course public money that's being spent with the um, with the recovery effort for the pandemic, but also with the idea of tackling the the climate crisis, um, and not just uh, you know taking into account the environmental effects of the climate crisis, but also the um, the, the the social consequences that you know, changing, uh, transitioning towards a greener economy will, will entail. So with, uh, with, with that in mind, um, there is a growing consensus on, uh, on, the, on the fact that uh, with, with this amount of stimulus on the table, public procurement has to be fit for purpose because of course a lot of this, uh, this money will be spent through, uh, through this tool and it needs to contribute to um, to these um, to the objectives of um, let's say of a more of a greener and more socially responsible recovery from uh, from from the pandemic and that in a way um, is why I'm a little bit more optimistic and hopeful in in the sense that pushing what we call strategic public procurement so using procurement um, to uh, to achieve policy goals essentially is what we've been trying to promote um, in in the last few years since the the latest reform of the of the directives, and now it seems like um, it's really picking up steam, um, even in places and in EU member states where it didn't seem to be such a sexy concept a few years ago. Um, the state of play, I would say, in the member states is still quite varied in the sense that, um, first of all, one of the challenges that we are facing at European level is, um, is monitoring the situation on the ground, to be entirely honest. Um, it's difficult to collect data on public procurement. Um, in, in many cases, national authorities or local authorities don't collect data on public procurement, and so it's also difficult to estimate exactly um, how much uh, of uh, of the how many of the procurements are actually um, taking into account um, the social impact of uh, of the purchase? Um, but what we have seen, uh, if you want, anecdotally, is that there is there is a lot of interest, and there are, and it's getting easier and easier to collect good examples. Of, um, of public authorities who, uh, who, who manage to carry out procurements that have a real impact on the ground and who have managed also to, um, to go, as, uh, as Professor McCrudden was, was saying, from requiring to actually implementing the, um, the procurement requirements in, uh, in reality. Um, the approach we've taken to um, to social considerations in public procurement in the Commission is, uh, is quite broad in the sense that we are more keen on uh, helping procurers um, do social procurement, like to, to put it in practice, rather than focusing so much on the, on the type of social objective that is being tackled. Um, and, and what we've seen in the past uh, two or three years where we've really worked on uh, on looking at the practice on the ground is that um, public buyers are really uh, are really keen to explore any type of uh, 
of social objective um, going, I would say, from the local to the global. So um, there's um, there's a lot of interest, of course, in how to create uh, job opportunities and occasions for for social inclusions for um, for the most vulnerable segments of the population, but also. Uh, there's the question of how to um, to cooperate more uh, with with social businesses, um, how to make uh, social ser services a bit more targeted and inclusive. And lately, uh, there's much more focus, and this is and this is something that we see on the ground at local level, but also let's say at at my level of uh, you know policymakers in uh, in Brussels. There's increasing interest, of course, in uh, the challenges of how you measure the impact of the life cycle um, of, uh, of a certain product or service, and also how you um, how you make supply chains, global supply chains in particular, more socially responsible. And that's, of course, with the objective in mind of leveling the playing field towards higher sustainability standards. So it also has if you want a strategic international dimension for the EU, but also how you deal with the global market if you're a, if you're a, a public buyer, how how do you deal, for example, with the differences in um, in, in in contractual power? Um, our role in all this has, of course, had to change, uh, especially after the, the the last reform of the directives. So we've shifted from um, focusing on enforcement of, of the rules uh, to ensure fair competition towards really trying in this framework of um, you know, fair competition and opening up the, uh, the European markets, uh, trying to support uh, and to cooperate more closely with, with public buyers and national authorities to accompany, let's say, this, this transition uh, towards, you know, looking at procurement as a as a strategic instrument as well, and in doing so, we've uh, we've produced quite a lot of guidance and support tools. Um, we've recently published a guide on socially responsible procurement, which was um, drafted with the help of uh, Abby, by the way. Um, but we're also working increasingly towards creating, let's say, a community of practice where we have a constant dialogue with, uh, with public buyers on the ground. And we, we do at the same time awareness raising, but we also try to, um, to understand what their challenges are. And we try to put uh, in touch uh, different, different public buyers to exchange uh, to exchange good practices and create some sort of collective knowledge on how to tackle um, these uh, these challenges we're just about to um, to launch a series of uh, lunchtime talks on uh, on socially responsible public procurement precisely with this with this intent and finally just to conclude one way we're trying to help at European level is also to um, introduce um, mandatory legislation on sustainable procurement, which will also tackle the social dimension. Obviously, this has to be done um, carefully uh, because we don't want to have any sort of like social washing or, or green washing. So this will be mostly sectorial efforts and mostly very targeted with the idea of trying wherever possible to harmonize um, the practice, the practice of buyers, in order to facilitate both buyers uh, from on the one side in introducing certain types of requirements and managing them to, throughout the life of the contract, but also facilitating in a way um, suppliers in, uh, in in responding and in in what kind of requirements they 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 may expect. So thank you for your attention. Thank I, you. I hope I hope I, re I I don't think I replied any of the very challenging questions of, <laughs> of Professor McCrudden, but yeah. Um, thank you very much, Anna, for for your thoughts and and for your contribution. Um, uh, we're going to move on uh, now to uh, Samantha Butler, who will introduce herself and offer her thoughts on uh, the questions or or on other related matters. 
Samantha. Uh, can't hear you yet, Samantha. Can't hear you, Samantha. I did press on mute. Can you hear me now? I can yes, hear you can. now. That's perfect. Okay. Oh, away you go. <laughs> okay. Well, I think I'm here to cover that practical side, some of what John was uh, pointing out there around implementation and, and delivery. Um, my name is Matt the Butler, as you said. Um, I have two roles, actually. I'm head of social value skills and engagement at the cabinet office in local authority where I'm the lead for six county council so a local authority environment implementing uh, social value uh, there in, in the procurement function across the organization I'm also a member of the national social value task force steering group and my background's in uh, I've left procurement functions in private and public sector and led the development of uh, the commissioning academies really focusing on commissioning for outcomes which I think is really you know, the wider talk topic that we're, we're covering here. So um, if I quickly reflect on uh, as I've asked you on procurement policy note 0620 as we call it which is the central government policy on social value it's important to reflect that actually that is based very much in the Public Services uh, Social Value Act 2012. This has been in place in, in our legislation for quite some time. Of course, that was the scope of services and uh, contracts primarily, um, also covering services with purchase and, and, of, of goods and works as well. Um, and this is a policy development, um, this procurement policy note, we call it, um, to really expand on that. And that was very much to further, encourage further diversification of government supply chains, um, as some of the other speakers were saying today, you know, to ensure that we are widening up those opportunities for smaller organisations, voluntary community social enterprises, mutuals too. And this was really seen as a tool which could really enable that. And also other priorities that are covered in the tool that goes alongside this policy very much around recovery. COVID-19 really is one of the themes within our new uh, policy statement and, and model. Also tackling economic inequalities, um, both covering uh, new jobs, new skills uh, in innovation, as well as opportunities for further, as I say, diversifying the supply market fighting climate change, equal opportunities, looking at uh, diversity, employment opportunities for people with disabilities, etc., are covered in those sorts of aspects. And then finally, well-being. So those are the so it's not any social value, it's really focused social value on wider um, policy objectives. This is about how money in a way to deliver on these policy outcomes. And the special value model is, of course, in effect, so mapped into the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These are all policy outcomes that we're trying to achieve when we spend money. But the, the model and the approach that we have, of course, is, is really evaluating the way an organisation delivers our contracts. These aren't, this isn't about adding another line to specifications. This is about saying when you're delivering this specific contract, how will you recruit? Can you do that in a way that will encourage opportunities in the supply chain for SMEs or VCSEs? Can you do that in a way that will provide opportunities for those not in education, employment and training or for prison leavers or for other activities? It's looking at the, the behaviours and the way an organisation's delivery. So it's very much part of the quality assessment of your specification. It's very much in that space. The policy um, has a number of key features in it to take it beyond the um, existing legislation, so the Social Value Act of 2012. Um, first of all, it is to expand that scope to all contracts over the public contracts regulations threshold. It's to not to just consider social value, but it is to explicitly evaluate social value with some exemptions, of course, that are really important for compliance with both the public contracts regulations and the World Trade Organization as well, ensuring that all requirements are always relevant and proportionate to the subject matter of the contract and also don't create um, or distort competition for small, medium organizations or voluntary community and social enterprises. There is also uh, central reporting for social value key performance indicators on government's most important contracts. And there's also mandatory training, you know, starting to get into John's point here around implementation. 
it's really key that this goes into the existing procurement process and becomes part of the natural process around setting up tenders um, very much in alignment uh, and part of the outsourcing playbook that you're very much looking upstream speaking and working with markets understanding the art possible integrating into that part of the tender process of course but also contract management as well lots of work going on cross government around contract management practices as well and likewise is also mandatory training for social value nearly 3,000 staff cross government have completed that in commercial function and beyond that we also have quite detailed training really looking at how you make the most of this how you can make this really effective um, and over 1600 staff have attended that too so that's on the central government side of course this also we're talking about a wider context so here I step into uh, a local authority mode so um, in Essex County Council they started off uh, I think you obviously sort of really covered you know, our motivations really and why we would do this well um, some time ago Essex County Council conducted a self-assessment using the local government association national procurement strategy survey and of course they were compliant but they really see that they could achieve more looking at the way an organization spend um, delivers on their contracts. And then again, very much as part of the quality criteria, introducing um, a new methodology for social value using the National Social Value Task Force uh, methodology, which is known as uh, colloquially as the TOMS, which is the Themes and Outcomes Method. It includes financial proxies and the finance uh, assessment, equivalence, economic uh, value applied to different types of social value. For us, it was a, a, a reduced list. It was a focus on specific social value priorities. So the priorities that you know, we'd identified through um, the organization's corporate strategy process, working with residents, etc. So first of all, um, a focus on job opportunities for those for that not in education, employment and training, for care leavers, for long-term unemployed. So this is about any organisation, wherever they're based, if they're recruiting, how can they do that in a way that also provides opportunities for those furthest from the job market? Skills and young people is another area of uh, priority in the um, Essex social value model. So looking at qualification opportunities, apprenticeships, work placements, part of the kickstart scheme um, uh, also uh, comes into scape there. And of course, also climate. And how do we How do we achieve that focus? Well, there's a, a wider um, list of social value opportunities, really giving those opportunities for organisations that have these wider benefits when they're delivering our contracts. But the um, areas of social value priority are given an additional weighting too to really encourage um, delivery in that space. In terms of John's points around implementation, I'd like to cover just a few of those. And I think it's important that it's not just about the contract management process. You need to prepare for this. You need to prepare markets for this. You have to build understanding both into your organization's procurement function, of course, but also in the wider stakeholders across the service owners in your own organization to really be speaking to markets ahead of time, speaking to vendors, ensuring they understand what's possible, what's appropriate in those markets, ensuring not and creating um, uh, unexpected uh, barriers to entry, et cetera. And it's also about building uh, awareness around those vendor bases of, of actually how we go about it, ensuring vendors know what they're going to see when we are tendering. So we have something called the Social Value Catalogue where we explain what is social value. It's a really it's a self-learning tool. We've got lots of examples in there and also particularly around the areas of skills and, and jobs, we've got how-to guides. We provide um, and wrap around services around how to achieve that. So if we want um, in organizations to be out reaching out to schools, to be preparing young people and helping them into the workplace or providing work placements or providing apprenticeships or kickstart um, roles. There's advice and guidance, step-by-step -step guidance, how to do that and some wraparound services such as job fairs, et cetera, to enable that. So it's really focused on delivery, not just a tool that gets us uh, you know, included into a tender document. 
Also, we're ensuring, you know, ahead, way ahead of procurements that organisations are aware of this. So, yes, we have the website. We also have a public launch. We are not with a, a social value festival, you know, really building awareness, focusing on different markets, ensuring there are those opportunities for organisations to engage with us and ask questions about that. And also um, implementing a reporting tool. So we have a reporting tool, first of all, to um, collect our social value commitment and then as part of our contract management process, managing to that delivery. So hopefully that just gives you a flavour of how we've implemented it locally, uh, as well as the national conference. And I'm happy to ask and uh, answer other questions around that. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed uh, for those uh, practical insights, which I think uh, were really helpful. Um, uh, I'm going to move on now to um, Deirdre Halloran, um, who is going to uh, give us, I think, some comparative perspectives on this. Hi, yeah, my name is uh, Deirdre Halloran and uh, I'm a teaching fellow at uh, Dublin City University in the Law Department and my uh, area of research is in sustainable procurement. And uh, it's a real pleasure to speak here today and um, it's been really interesting so far. Unlike Samantha, I'm not going to be offering much in terms of practical advice. It is more of a, an academic perspective. And just to say, um, it's a real privilege to be here with Professor McCrudden, who is, uh, I'm sure uh, many would agree, is directly responsible for many of us uh, getting involved in this um, area. And uh, getting us trapped in this uh, groundhog, groundhog world but which we were which we are desperately trying to escape from um uh, every reiteration of it we're getting ever so slightly better and we will one day escape from it all so that's so my area of what i'm looking at in my research is just the connection between um value for money and social value and it does link to one of the questions that uh, professor mercrudden was was asking and it was like how do we incentivize professionals, uh, procurement professionals to, you know, implement um, social procurement in their clauses. And in a roundabout way, I will maybe point to that at the end of what I'm going to say. So, you know, as we know, value for money is the main objective of most, well, probably all national procurement systems. And I'm interested in the idea of how it is regularly treated as being pretty much equivalent to economic efficiency. And so we're getting to what Abby was looking at as this, the, or, the economic orthodoxy that surrounds uh, procurement regulation. And so if we look at the, to the UK, we can see that, you know, the overriding procurement policy is that all public procurement must be based on value for money. And it's defined as the best mix of quality and effectiveness for the least outlay over the period of use of the goods or services bought. So that's so that's the overall framework in which we must embed social uh, procurement. If we look at, uh, you know, I, I look at Ireland, I look at many jurisdictions, but if we look at Ireland, Ireland is quite similar. We um, our procurement policy is on the delivery of public services in a sustainable manner by ensuring value for money and access to public procurement opportunities for business. And we're concerned with the eff efficient and effective use of resources. So um, the, the issue here is, is that in, in procurement regulation, we can't disassociate it from the economics of procurement. It's, it's often conceived of being, procurement itself is often conceived of being directly concerned with the pursuit of economic efficiency and superficially at least it's often um conceived seen as as attempting to be part of constructing this idea of, of of perfect competition and so if we follow that view then the issue is is that when we include social and environmental policies it has to necessarily deviate from this economic definition of economic efficiency um, because it does generate significant distortions of, comp of competitive market dynamics. And, you know, following that logic, then you are restricting the chances for the buyer to obtain best value within a certain framework. And so that's that to me is the problem. So we are asking professionals to embed something within their systems and we're encouraging them to do it. 
But on an, on another level, we're asking them not to do it. And so we have these inherent tensions between the principle of public good, maximizing social and environmental value. And then we have this need to assess in, from auditing in many jurisdictions when you're assessing value for money, it's, it's, it's within, it is still within the least amount spent. And, um, and so one way of shifting this is if one is to view public procurement and economic policy, if one is to sh is to change the lens and to and to say and to look at it through more more of a, a political economic lens, and and then we could argue that you know economic policy and public procurement policy, we would say well they're not neutral. These are not just neutral uh, activities. And if we were to say that economic efficiency in and of itself it isn't just a normative uh, value that it is, it is not value neutral, but it's, it's value laden and, you know, that it reflects a, a certain perspective and it has a certain goal within it. And if we take that view, um, well, then we could say perhaps that the problem is not lying with social value and the need to include it and all the difficulties we have around evaluating it, but that it lies within the fact that we're, we're placing um, uh, our value for money um, within a particular framework. So why, why would this in any way help incentivize public procurement uh, professionals? Well, m the idea that I would have is that, is that when in my research and when, you, when, when we are asking these questions of uh, professionals as to why they can't, why they aren't including uh, social considerations within their, they do have this conflict. They still feel a conflict. And so I think, that unfortunately, to escape from this, to escape from our Groundhog Day reality, there has to be an acceptance that all of the different departments have to agree that it is, we are creating tensions and we are creating difficulties when we, on one level, are promoting it and on another level, we're not promoting it. Um, so I will, uh, th that is pretty much all I have to say. And uh, I will leave it to others to try and answer the rest of the questions. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much uh, for that great contribution. Um, uh, we're going to move now to Andrea McLean, who's going to talk about the social value journey in Northern Ireland. Thank you, Anne. Can everyone hear me OK? Yeah, we can hear you perfectly. Great. Um, good afternoon, everyone. It um, is a real pleasure to be able to talk um, today's session and offer, hopefully, um, an operational perspective on our social value approach within Northern Ireland. So I work for the Strategic Investment Board and I am based within the social value team. So we are part of public sector, but we are not civil servants. So our team essentially work alongside um, procurement teams, commissioners, and contract managers to advise on the social value element of tenders. And I hope that I'm doing some positive work there and not merely contributing to this um, groundhog situation. Um, but within Northern Ireland, we are certainly in a sort of period of significant change. Um, and really the main reason for that is a policy that was recently approved by the executive here, which essentially mandates that from June, 1st of June, 2022, tenders must include a minimum of 10% of the total award criteria um, for social value. So we have got, you know, a significant enough implementation um, period, but I sort of thought for, for today's um, session, it might be interesting if I kind of briefly touch upon our journey and maybe some of the key lessons and then talk a bit about that policy in terms of our journey. So the social value unit that sits within SIB was set up in 2014. And at the time, the focus, as you can imagine, was very much on jobs creation, which worked, which has worked really, really well on construction and general services contracts, but proved certainly to be slightly trickier to apply on the more specialist contracts such as ICT. Um, really kind of that the lesson there then translated into us taking more of a sector-specific approach um, and certainly widening out those social value um, outcomes. Uh, 
very similar to the ones that Samantha had talked about earlier. So a much broader range and actually a lot more flexibility for the contractors um, in terms of how they actually go about delivering their requirements. Um, we have learnt a lot of lessons um, over the years, but um, I've picked out a few uh, to talk around. And I think the first one, as much as you want to be efficient and standardise things, um, a one size fits all approach just doesn't work. And I um, lead over ICT contracts, and I think that was blatantly clear and was certainly um, the reason for developing a much wider approach. And listening to the feedback from the bidders and the contractors and the brokerage organizations and kind of taking stock um, and then developing the approach accordingly. And certainly, I think our journey has certainly been defined by collaboration across public, private and third sectors. Um, and I think some of the most interesting social value outcomes are when you see private sector contractors forming strategic partnerships with organisations such as social enterprises to help deliver against their requirements. Um, and another, I suppose, example of collaboration is when we basically co-designed our approach for ICT industries with procurement procurement professionals and um, also the ICT companies as well. The next lesson, whenever I was thinking about it, I thought, well, this is really obvious, you know, um, but actually so obvious, but sometimes not done very well. And I think it comes back um, to Professor McCredden's comment around implementation and contract management. And I suppose the lesson is really the need for strong contract management and having processes in place um, to manage any poor performance. We thankfully have been very lucky to have implemented a monitoring stage at quite an early, um, early on in our journey. So really that's allowed us for every single contract that has social value on it to track exactly where the contractor is, you know, in relation to what they're required to do versus what they're actually delivering. Um, and, and within Northern Ireland, even though we sort of work alongside contract managers, it is the contract managers that they themselves, so it's the contracting authorities that are managing the social value elements. And I think that's important just to communicate the importance of it to contractors. Um, so by having, you know, they're getting the monitoring reports, they're putting it on their, you know, monthly contract review meetings, and they're, we're kind of working alongside that to offer advice um, when needed. And I suppose the fourth lesson is, there's so much focus on scoring social value, which is great and such an important development. Um, but it's, it's that recognition really that social value can be achieved in a number of different ways throughout the procurement life cycle. And I suppose it's about recognising that and, and not maybe missing some of the more simpler ways to try and increase and, and maximise social value. So in terms of this, this new policy, um, like I said, it's going to come into effect in June of next year. It was co-designed by procurement practitioners and representatives from the private sector, the social enterprise sector and the trade union movement. And we don't have social value legislation within Northern Ireland. So this is a very significant development for us in terms of really strengthening the policy framework for social value and also communicating to the markets that this is an this is a Northern Ireland executive um, priority. Um, so I, I think that is certainly um, a very strong um, mandate. Uh, the other thing as well is that the policy will actually see social value being applied to a much wider range of contracts. Um, and also within the policy, there is a commitment to consider the use of reserved contracts. So hopefully uh, as a result of that, we will see a lot more bid opportunities opening up for organizations such as social enterprises. Um, so it's great we've got the policy um, big development, but now our role is about operationalizing that. So at the moment we are developing what the actual approach will look like um, for scoring, but taking into consideration everything that we've learned um, through trying to implement social value through special conditions up until now. So again, coming back to that one size fits all um, potentially doesn't always work. And um, the other thing that we are doing 
training will be key. So we are developing and we're going to roll out specific training for a number of different cohorts. So there's going to be a separate one for commissioners, one for contract management teams, one for procurement teams, and then also one for suppliers. And alongside that, we and developing a range of different guidance documents and model criteria. And one of the kind of key valuable resources that we found to date is having a brokerage database um, which sits on our website and essentially connects contractors with organisations predominantly in the third sector that can support them to deliver against their social value requirements. So we will constantly evolve in that as well and I suppose just to, to finish on my point around contract management we um, have sort of built into our implementation process that we are going to be redeveloping our monitoring system just to make sure that it is fully compliant then with the new approach. That's very much um, a whistle stop tour of social value within Northern Ireland hopefully it, um, it's I think it touches on the contract management issue but I'm not sure if it, offered any answers but happy um, to answer any questions. Wonderful thank you very much indeed for for that contribution um, and so uh, we turn now to the uh, last member of our panel to speak uh, Richard Simmons from the University of Stirling. Richard. Thank you very much Anne and uh, uh, nice to see everyone. Um, th there's always uh, nervousness going last on a panel like this uh, for several reasons. One that uh, you worry that everyone else is overrun and, and you're not going to have any time to speak. Secondly, that um, that by the time we get to this point, everyone said everything useful that's got to be said. And and thirdly, that um, that uh, you're so inspired by what everybody else has said that um, that your your head's buzzing with with all that stuff. And I think all three apply. In this case, so I'll try to uh, stick to the script a little bit and, uh, and, and, and think about that. So I'm, I'm Dr. Richard Simmons. I'm uh, currently leading a, a UKRI funded project looking at uh, local government procurement. And I think the link to social value, social goals that we've focused on in this session is particularly important. The, the project is called Optimising Outcomes from uh, Procurement and Partnering. And... Um, in terms of thinking about optimising outcomes, uh, we're thinking about two things there really. One is about optimising outcomes for communities. And the other one is then optimising outcomes through procurement. And both of these are, are key tasks of governance. And I think that requires us to look at these different levels and understandings. That's come out very strongly, I think, in the session today. Different levels of understandings of this. So one is uh, on procurement as governance. Um, but then the other is on the governance of procurement. So in the project, we've, we've asked questions around what actually happens when we pull the lever of procurement to support the production of these kinds of outcomes and social value that, that, that we care about. And actually the evidence is that perhaps when we pull that lever at the moment, it's just a little bit underpowered. It's done a great job during COVID. And there's, there's lots of good stories and lots of progressive work going on. But actually, there's also evidence that uh, we could power up that lever of procurement even further. So what can we do about that? I think the answer is, uh, and I think this has come out quite strongly in what people have talked about, it, it actually depends. And, and it depends on various things. Sometimes there are, are things that seem un, in, irresolvable in the current environment. I think this is where the notion of Groundhog Day uh, keeps coming back, that they're irresolvable. We're not going to, to, to solve them. But I think in lots of the evidence that this session's put forward, what we've seen, in fact, are just differences that are finding their way towards res resolution. And so Anna talked about harmonisation, various other people have talked about how we're trying to, to dovetail initiatives that bring people together and, and, and actually start working to a situation where we're seeing more congruence between what's going on or consonance within the system. And I think this brings about the opportunities for more positive sumness that enables us to go beyond the contractual minimum and also to extend the reach of these uh, contractual benefits. And, and the idea that there are differences that need to be resolved is important, but sometimes when they become mismatches, um, that then just leads to so much dissonance and noise in the system that it's very difficult to make pro progress. And uh, it feels to me like that becomes very zero sum compared with the positive sumness that, that we might achieve if we can find ways around that. And some of the, some of the problems seem to me to be 
problems of omission and some of them are problems of commission. And um, we need to think about whether it, are we just not thinking about this in terms of what are the issues of scale here? Uh, is there mutual support between different levels of scale that actually allow people to, to, to achieve that sense of congruence in, in, in what they're aiming for? Um, and that's as much about sort of multi-level go governance and adaptive governance at different levels um, as, as, as anything else. Also, how do we define value and how do we think about value and, uh, and, and what we achieve there in terms of social value or any other form of value and the values that underpin our understandings of those different forms of value? Um, how do we challenge then um, and think about non-recognition non of, of, of things like value leakage? So value leaks out of the system in different places, whether that's at the commissioning end of, uh, of, of procurement or during the, 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 the process of awarding contracts or in that contract management phase. How do we then think about um, value leakage and where that happens? And are we recognising it and picking that up? Do we have assumptions of zero sumness that start us from the wrong place? Can we build out different ways of thinking about things that then change the lens, as one of the speakers put it? Um, and I think what's the sum then of the primary and the secondary value that we're seeking to achieve in contracts and how do we strike that kind of balance as well is, is an important question. So in the research project that, uh, that we have, um, we're, we're asking lots of these questions. We're thinking about the, the, the scale issue through things like uh, notions like system leadership. We're also thinking about how do we develop a healthy procurement ecosystem and the, the, the very interesting uh, uh, words that Andrew was speaking a moment ago um, very much sort of spoke, I think, to that, about how can we continue to develop that? And, and Samantha spoke about that as well in, in relation to what she's doing in Essex. So, I think that's really, really important um, because together they, they, they work out ways that we can build future resilience, whether that's about building back better uh, or whether it's about preparing ourselves for any future crises. Um, I think those, those, that sort of form of resilience from system leadership on the one hand and developing the healthy procurement ecosystem in an inclusive way is very important as well. And these add power then to the lever of procurement to help deliver the social goals and outcomes that we all care about. So in the project, we're also developing ideas around value and the different ways we might understand that in terms of what's, where positive sum value comes from within contracts, but also how we deal with additionality and build that. We're also thinking about data um, and we're also thinking about capacity issues. And one of, one of the things that we've been discussing with various stakeholders is how even if we were to, to, to get an uplift in value of 1% on current expenditure in local government, that would be a really significant resource. And if then we use 10% of that 1% to improve the capacity and in, enhance the capacity in local government for, for considering these issues more carefully and to, 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 to working towards government, that could make a, 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 an ongoing difference year on year as well. So it just struck me that um, the, the, the idea of Groundhog Day um, is very true. I'm, I'm not sure about where we stand on that. It sounds like there are, there are some very progressive uh, things going on. Certainly we've heard about some of that in our research. But I suppose in terms of governance, setting it in that frame, governance is always a task that's unfinished. And um, uh, I think in terms of some of the social goals we're working towards, lots of these are wicked issues that, um, that, that aren't problems that will necessarily get solved they just continually resolved and resolved over time time and time again so it can feel like groundhog day i think but if we do see progress that's good so i suppose some of the questions then that, that come out of that is how do we seize the opportunities that there are now this definitely does feel like a moment we're being told this in our research as well this is the moment for change how do we seize those opportunities of stimulus spending and law reform in particular to build back better promote social goals prepare better for future crises how do we make sure that we work with these trade-offs and, and to do some of the trade-offs that we've identified during this session have to be seen as competing objectives? Um, or are there complementarities that we can find between them, perhaps through greater dialogue or greater analysis or sharing of, of um, good practice in the way we've heard about? And also, how can we work across different levels of scale and work with different notions of value um, from different stakeholders to help procurement deliver on social goals and outcomes. Uh, 
Wonderful. Thank you, Richard. And uh, thank you for ending with some great questions to uh, get us moving through into the discussion uh, phase of our session. Um, we are a little short on time, but we've got enough time for some questions. So uh, what I'd like to do is collect a few up and then give our panelists an opportunity to address those that they uh, particularly want to address. Um, and just while, uh, if you're in the room, please wave at me in a sort of fairly frantic manner, because I've got a lot of screens in front of me, which are a bit distracting. Um, and obviously, if you're if you're online or both online and in the room, um, please put your question um, in the chat. Um, so just a couple from me to get the, the ball rolling, really. We've heard quite a bit about um, contract management and the issue around making sure that, you know, grand commitments that are made maybe at the bidding stage, at the, the contract award stage, um, actually happen in practice. And I'm, I'm really interested to know what panelists think about what the obstacles are to uh, seeing those commitments through at the management stage. So is it resources? Is it training? I see somebody in the chat has suggested that training might be an issue, um, but Samantha talked a little bit about the, the role of training. Are they legal issues around the strengths and weaknesses of, of contracts as a, 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 a way of, a, of governing a particular situation? Is it an issue about the way that relationships are or aren't built up? Um, I know that's a, a strong theme in, in Julian's work, that importance of partnership working rather than thinking of it as a sort of, uh, you know, more transactional kind of thing? Or is it just to do with policy priorities that the, the sort of management phase is seen as very secondary to the to the sort of award phase? Or is it something completely different? Um, I'd really love to know what um, colleagues on the panel think about that. Um, there's also a great question in the chat about um, sharing best practice and uh, collective learning. Um, obviously, we've been able to pull together today people from uh, lots of different institutions, jurisdictions, and I think there's been quite a lot of common ground about what some of the problems are. Um, so what, uh, to what extent can we sort of institutionalise a process of, of shared learning? Um, our questioner, um, Susan brown Shuffy, um, suggests in the WTO context, but maybe there are other settings in which that kind of peer learning process could take place. So those are a couple from me. Um, have we got any questions in the room? Can I ask a related yeah, question? Yeah, yeah, so ask a question. Yeah, you know. Sure. Ask a um, well, the following is probably not shocking to practitioners, but just because academics might have more questions than answers on this particular topic doesn't mean the practitioners should stop innovating, right? We still want practitioners to keep uh, moving forward and, and, and learning. But, you know, how do we make sure that we know more, inf know more next time? So if the goldfish does go around, at least there's some more information that we have. And so my question was for Samantha Butler or others who are involved in implementing these kinds of things, like how do you know if it's working? So you're, you know, you're working in a council or, you know, or another public authority that's doing these things. How will you know next time that, that actually this worked or this didn't work would be a question that I have. Uh, great, thank you very much. Um, I think what I'm going to do then, um, I, I can see Abby with a hand raised. Um, I don't know whether it's a question or an answer. Um, but what I'm going to do is um, just uh, work through the panel um, and let you uh, respond to those questions that um, uh, we've just raised and to any of the other things that came up during the course of discussion from your fellow panelists. Um, you're going to have to be fairly snappy. Um, and I'll go back round in the in the order that we came for came uh, in, um, except that I feel I should give Chris the last word so that he can tell us whether it's Groundhog Day or not um, at this point. Um, so, in fact, Abby, that means we're coming to you. So, uh, if that was a question, you can also ask it to your colleagues. No, it was just to respond briefly to the the two questions that you'd put forward, and so. Just, just about perhaps an obvious one, but maybe one that sometimes gets overlooked in terms of this gap between the procurement process and the implementation is that it's it's different people responsible so that the people involved in procurement have very little to do with contract management and vice versa. Um, you know, and that that's partly reflection of the fact that procurement procedures have become 
technical, complex, um, something that is seen as relatively specialized. The involvement of, of uh, users and contract managers in those procedures has, has in many cases become fairly, fairly minimal. Um, and I think, you know, there, there's, there is a question, and I, if you look at where you do see, um, you know, good practice, quite often it's more, you're seeing it within local government, because when you look at central government, you have a lot more sort of centralized procedures, um, you know, even different agencies, uh, centralized procurement bodies responsible for setting up procurement, who are, you know, a totally different organization to the one that's actually um, managing the contract. So I think we can look to local government for, for some better examples. Um, of how you close that implementation gap. Thanks, Abby. Um, Colin, um, do you want to come in on any of those questions? Sure, I, I definitely echo a lot of what Abby just shared, especially on this first question around contract management. And I think, Anne, you mentioned sort of a, a bunch of possibilities for why this is so challenging, including resources, training, legal issues, the relationship piece. I think it's really all of the above. And I think it really depends on what commodity or service we're talking about. I think in the U.S. context, so much of contract management, I think, is driven by priorities. I mean, there's so many, at least at the state and local level, there's so much procurement and contracting happening that there's sort of a question around where do you prioritize your time? And I think Abby mentioned there's procurement professionals who are so focused on the sourcing piece of getting these contracts in place that they're then also being asked to kind of manage these contracts. And often the only time they can really give attention to that is when there's a major issue, whether it's a compliance breach and they need to sort of intervene to, to fix something. And there's less time for sort of ongoing relationship management. Um, but I think one of the things that we've tried to work on at the Government Performance Lab in the US is to try to pick some high profile, high priority contracts within governments at the state and local level and put systems in place to kind of draw attention on an ongoing basis to improving service delivery, especially for those contracts that are more critical to an agency or department's uh, mission within, within a, a jurisdiction. Um, great, thank you, Colin. Um, Anna, um, any thoughts from you? Yeah, I just wanted to come in uh, on the question on uh, on sharing good practices. I think this is uh, it's an effort that requires diffused um, actions in the sense that. Um, there are different actions and techniques that you can use to uh, to share good practices and at different levels actually i mean you can start with the sort of like policy making level but but also the 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 local level i mean it will be precious um for for buyers to 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 talk to each other and exchange um on on their experiences um what we've seen a lot is that you know you have to maybe try to create momentum um, in, in, on the basis of uh, either something that, uh, you know, at our level, at let's say more policy making level, you publish and then you continue to communicate on that and then you continue to engage with, uh, with buyers on or um, what we've also tried to do and it seems to work quite well is to put buyers at the same table and ask them to um, to share their challenges and work together on those challenges and that's also a different way maybe of of sharing experience i mean you don't necessarily share good practices but different buyers come in with with different ideas um, as concerns the wto i mean it's certainly a forum where it's interesting i mean we we also exchange um quite a, a lot with uh, with international partners on uh, on 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 good practices on sustainable procurement but it is sometimes a little bit of a stiffer <laughs> forum for exchange so you need you need more uh, and varied actions um and 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 different types of exchanges uh, to to keep the community of practice alive thanks anna that was um, very uh, delicately put to coin a phrase from earlier um uh, samantha um any thoughts from you yes i think um First of all, you're talking about training, and I think it's really important. And I bet I don't think it, it, it should be seen in its broadest sense. So, first of all, 
um, you need to ensure that the procedures are there and that people are aware of those procedures and are adhering to those procedures. Um, it's mandatory for us in, in Essex County Council to consider social value up to a flexible weighting of 10%. It is a requirement and is keyed into the um, procurement process. Then you've got to ensure it's done well. Um, and so we have training around that, we have guidance around that. We and then beyond that, we also then are working with the services. It's really important that the procurement teams aren't doing this in isolation, that they're working with the service areas, the budget owners to achieve this. But what we're doing is really working as this as a, an organisation objective, not just a procurement objective. So we're working with strategic directors to look at the opportunities. For example, if we're looking at job opportunities for care leavers or for a, or a particular cohort, that is delivering into wider objectives of the organisation. And that's very much how we're seeing it. And that's how we are really positioning our training and engagement. And then thirdly, as I mentioned earlier, it's really important that we bring the markets with us. So we have broader um, events to raise awareness of the methodology. As I said, we have a whole website and area de dedicated to this to raise awareness of it, um, going into exactly the same materials that are available to staff, what they would expect to see in a tender, and then examples to really illustrate what's being, what's the art of the possible is, but encouraging that innovation. As I say, this is about the way an organization is delivering your specification. It's how they recruit if they're going to recruit. And there are lots of examples available to them to achieve that, as well as I say, some of the wraparound services and, and the how-to guide. So it's really important that we do that. And then of course, in pre-market engagement or in category, we have a category management function. So um, they are looking at even pretender, working with markets, raising awareness um, and ensuring that's understood. And in terms of contract management, I think it's really important it's not seen as something very separate. We're talking about it as being part of value for money, as part of delivering on the investments uh, that we make and we spend on behalf of residents. So um, we should be contract managing this in a way that we, we do with ever, every other requirement. Of course, um, everything has to be relevant and proportionate um, in, in every case. In Essex, we actually have contract managers. It's, it's um, the uh, above 100 thousand procurements are managed by procurement and um, contracts are too and we have supplier relation management management as part of those uh, mechanisms too so we are working on our largest contracts working with uh, providers again making sure we're having those conversations about delivery so I have uh, I've had many um, conversations with some of our strategic suppliers about um, their delivery and their performance on contract, um, sorry, on social value as well. Um, great, thank you very much indeed. Um, I can see Richard with a hand raise, but if you don't mind, I'm gonna continue in the order and come to you in a, in a few moments. So um, Deirdre, um, I think you're up next. Yeah, so th this idea of the contract management that's always going to when when we do research and we're 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 talking with the people who actually have to try and implement the the, the social considerations, um, the, the the pressure on what can be called like let's say the internal facilitator of the social uh, procurement, the pressure on them is is immense, and unless that person is given enough resources in act to do to do the job. The burnout is is so intense and they feel all of this burden on them to represent this whole idea that we're talking about right now. And yet they can be the least paid person and they have this, this these multiple jobs in which they may be talking, for instance, with, you know, community workers. They may be talking with, you know, the construction company and this one or two or three people, usually one person has to do all of these roles. And we've seen examples of people having to go out on, on, on stress leave because it's just impossible. So that to me is the key. If we actually care about this, so then that is, we would actually make that be such an important role. So that's the idea. Do we care about it? So the idea is, is that, you know, we can talk about it, but it really has to be something that politically we are willing to fund. So that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you very much um, uh, for, for that um, uh, strong opinion there. Thank you, that was great. Um, Andrea. Um, thanks, I just have a couple um, of quick points. I suppose the first one is 
getting the actual tender question right in the first place so that it's not so open-ended and bidders are thinking, what are you asking here? So they throw everything in and whenever it comes to contract management and you're looking at the responses and you think, what have you actually signed up to here? What's quantifiable? So I would say, even though that is still relates to procurement, I think it's important to get the basic right, first of all. Um, I think it's also, I suppose, there's a big difference between managing a contract where the social value requirements are in relation to, say, job opportunities and work placements versus, you know, if you've got an ethical supply chain requirement and you as a contract manager are trying to drill down into the information that the contractors are providing. And I suppose that's probably an expertise issue and, you know, training and also maybe looking at other organisations that are experts in that that you could maybe work with. Um, and I suppose as well, it's all about, you know, is it a priority um, for government? Is that communicated? You know, how are contract managers communicating it when they're working with contractors to make sure that they know that, you know, this is mandatory, it must be delivered and that they've got a monitoring system in place and that they actually are mentioning it at meetings and following up um, on it. Um, and I suppose just even I find that once contractors start delivering and contracting authorities see the outcomes that they are instantly you know, more engaged, they're almost, you know, instantly more bought into it because they can see what's happening on the ground and what's being delivered. And um, so just a couple of quick thoughts there. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and uh, Richard, uh, over to you. If you've got a really quick question for one of your colleagues, um, you could probably sneak it in now as well as a few thoughts of your own. <laughs> I think there's been lots of questions. And as somebody said earlier, uh, I think it was you, Rory, academics have often got more questions than answers. But um, I think from, from our point, uh, I just thought from the project, it might be worth throwing in a couple of uh, insights in terms of the questions that have been raised. The um, and at both ends, really, of the of the of the cycle. So the first one was uh, I was talking with a uh, a commercial manager of a, in a local authority, and he said, "Oh, yeah, the, the relationship changed between uh, we we became much more mature in procurement about three or four years ago." And I said, "Okay, what, what's the reason for that?" So I don't know. He said, "Just procurement changed a little bit. Uh, it stopped bec becoming an obstructive force and started becoming much more constructive and 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 willing to think about outcomes with us." So I prompted him a little bit more and he said, we set up a procurement board at that time. He uh, said about three or four years ago, set up a procurement board where all the strategic managers met with the procurement team. I said, so do you think that was the moment? And it was very interesting how he just went, do you know what, actually, I think it was. Well, he'd never put the two together before, that setting up this procurement board where there was a chance for better communication and better understanding was actually a crucial thing in terms of stimulating better procurement. I think the other, the other end of things... Um, I think that the one one of our one of the people we spoke with talks about how once contracts have been let, often political oversight goes. So re the reporting back to committees and back to local councillors and political oversight of contracts was actually much lower uh, than it was for for um, in house service provision. And I think that's probably an interesting one as well. If we're going to have the political leadership that uh, that says we need to value contract management then possibly it's about making sure that our political leaders are asking for the information about how contracts are performing and, and, they, and, and then given that information because it's not seen as being commercially sensitive or somehow out of the political space. So I just thought that they were, those were a couple of, uh, of insights from the project where people have spoken about some of these issues that, uh, that, that might be helpful. Great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, so I, I, I do this with my heart in my mouth now. Um, Chris, Groundhog Day or not? Um, I, I, and the idea of you having your heart in your mouth speaking to me uh, is, is, uh, is the most unconvincing statement I've heard all day. Um, those, those of you who don't know that Anne, Anne, uh, Anne was uh, my most brilliant uh, student who taught me pretty much everything that I know. Um, so, um, so, so I just make a couple of comments. I'm not going to respond to your provocative question. Um, let me come back to some to, to the to the law. Uh, and I know I know um, those of you who are not lawyers just hate lawyers. I, I understand that. 
Um, but, but nevertheless, I do not know any major piece of research that's been done on implementation of social value or equivalence in procurement uh, that has interviewed uh, procurement specialists and, and practitioners who have not expressed a view that the uncertainty of legal context matters. Um, and um, if that's the case, and this is really Ab, uh, this really echoes um, uh, one of Abby's points in in the chat about the, the sort of the legalization, as it were, of of this process. Um, we are talking about a legal process, um, whether we like it or not. Um, and the the issue that I sort of want to mention really is that. Um, uh, in a, a state of change, which we clearly are, I, agree, I acknowledge that, the fact that the law is now changing in the UK, um, while the policy is also changing, really creates a potentially perfect storm here. So um, I do not know any single uh, practical procurement professional who is expert in the WTO system, for example, in the UK. I mean, they have just about got on top of the EU system after the changes. Um, and it's a complex system, but it sort of works. Nobody has any idea whether the WTO system works in practice um, with regard to social value. It just is not the information. There's lots of guidance, but there is no firm uh, jurisprudence, if you want to put it that way, um, that's going to guide this. So this is an issue. Um, which I'm sure the, the new legislation that we anticipate coming through in Westminster, uh, I hope soon, um, I haven't seen it yet, um, uh, is going to solve, but I sort of doubt it. So the question then is, what do we do about those uncertainties? Um, and it really echoes um, Deirdre's point as well about uh, what you're expecting of procurement professionals here. It, to be honest, it's just unfair <laughs> to dump this complete lack of certainty uh, in terms of what the legalities are here on a procurement professional um, in just the way that Deirdre has, has, has mentioned um, in terms of the expectations that we have. So I absolutely agree with everything that, that um, Deirdre has said. So, so um, you know, leaving aside the, the new policy context, um, I have really yet to hear anything on the implications of the new legal context. Inter interacting with that new policy context. Um, and the fact, for example, that, that we're expecting or hoping that we're going to share good practice, well, at, at a stroke, we have cut ourselves off from the, legal, from the good practice that is de being developed in the European Union. Um, and the idea that we're going to now to be able to share practice when the system that's operating um, with regard to the European Union is going to be different from that to the top rating in the rest of the UK is going to make sharing some of that practice also extremely difficult. So welcome to the sunny uplands. <laughs> uh, that's a great note on which to end. Uh... <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, can I uh, say a massive thank you uh, to our wonderful panel? I hope you all agree um, they've been great. It's been a really stimulating discussion, uh, even if we maybe haven't quite satisfactorily answered all the questions. Um, so thank you very much, panel. Uh, thank you, uh, audience, for your contributions in the chat um, and those of you in the room as well. Um, can I do a quick plug for POGO? If you'd like to continue these conversations, we have a Procurement of Government Outcomes Network, which uh, meets on the last Tuesday of the month on Zoom, and we talk about uh, Procurement of Government Outcomes. Uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, so we, we normally have a, a great lineup of speakers, a lively discussion, and uh, if you would like to do more of this, there is that opportunity. Um, I think Lee has been plugging it uh, in the chat too. Um, can I just uh, draw your attention to the fact that the next session in the conference um, is at six o'clock um, our time. Uh, it's a public debate uh, entitled Politicians in the Boardroom, How Government Should Handle Responsible Business. A great lineup of speakers for that. So do stick around for that either online or in person. Um, and unless I've forgotten anything else, very Absolutely. final thing 
is uh, Nigel from the GoLab has got some things he wants to say. I don't even know what they are, Thank but you. <laughs> here he is. Thank you, Anne. I'm just hijacking the end of this session because uh, I'm not sure we'll have time at the public talk, which is the final session of the conference. I'm going to use this time to say a few very important thank yous. The first one is to one of you, both in person and online. Thank you for joining us, speakers and uh, delegates alike. It's been particularly enjoyable to be able to welcome people back in person. And I hope that next year, um, on the 8th and 9th of September 2022, um, many of you who have joined this year online will come to Oxford. And um, we've had a wonderful time, the few of us that have made it to Oxford this year. Um, the next thank you goes to my amazing team. It has been a phenomenal amount of work to put this together. I mean, it always is, but it's been even harder this year because of the hybrid conference. And we practiced a lot and we made a lot of embarrassing mistakes, but we had some fun along the way. So thank you to 